market dynamics uh, are very confusing to people. So, free cash ready nine, right there, start. Well, Americans have always been risk takers. Nothing known to man is predictable one-to-one -one correlation. The returns from stocks don't come because one person knows this stock is going to do better than that stock. It's basically impossible to beat the, beat the market. A market that works protects everybody. Invest, a precise, prudent, lifelong quest to progressively build wealth. Investing, to me, is positioning your capital to earn market rates of return so that you're going to have all those things down the road that you want. A process that will help ensure that the significant and meaningful purpose for the money is realized. Yet the word invest is frequently used as a generic term for money intermingled in high-risk games or schemes of speculating and gambling. Gambling to me is gambling money you don't have or you can't afford to lose. Speculating d doesn't always mean investing. I think it means taking a chance. God forbid that you would ever take your investment capital and use it to speculate. Understanding investing seems to be the public's perennial puzzle. What makes a stock move? That's, that's one of the things that confuses people more than anything partly because there's n never any real simple answer. We're much more inclined to, to speculate and guess, again, because of the discipline, the, uh, all the difficulty it takes into making far more calculated judgments. So I, I think, in general, human beings tend to be speculators. The history of gambling, when does it first appear in, in the, the world? world? Yeah. Oh, very before antiquity. Indeed, gambling is ancient. It first appears in the Stone Age. Cavemen honed the ankle bones of sheep into mankind's original pair of dice. Tens of thousands of years later, the origin is also the nickname for dice. Where are the dice? Let's have okay. the bones. The bones. Give the man the bones. <laughs> He's got the bones. Three, two, and a Throw four, the bones out. Wow. Do it. Cavemen were the first professional gamblers, rolling the bones for another cave's meat instead of risking the hunt. Ancient Egyptians gambled. Those who went bust toiled the remainder of their lives on rock piles. The Romans created lotteries. Men in India wagered regularly. A rajah with a penchant for playing dice lost his wife, 200,000 slaves, and his throne just before he gambled away his life, killed when he did not pay a debt. Gambling predates China's 4,000-year written history. Confucius records a loser who could not pay, was obliged to have his arm amputated, and presented his payment to his opponent. Despite the risks, gambling endured, maneuvering from century to century, society to society. The British and the French both gambled. And those are the Europeans who, I mean, the, who, and the Dutch. All three of those, um, of those European uh, peoples who settled in in what would become the United States gambled and they so they brought those games with them the first American president George Washington was an avid gambler playing high-stakes cards with his soldiers to pass the long tense nights of the Revolutionary War he loved the horses as both better and bookie and Washington was compulsive about the lottery buying the first lottery ticket of the initial federal lottery in 1792 which by the way was the same year the New York Stock Exchange was born. We've had stock exchanges uh, si since the 18th and 19th century in Western Europe and in the United States. But before the stock exchange was regulated, there was much more um, speculating and risk-taking that was likened to gambling. That's because men called stock jobbers ruled the market in the late 18th century. Speculators and stock jobbers were thought of uh, as gamblers. Stock jobbers, the direct ancestors of stockbrokers, made fortunes and commissions using the local tavern as their busy office. So we had liquor and gambling going on in the bars, and they actually sold in, in for specula speculative reasons and speculation and gambling. And so that's, that's the heritage of the market. 
And to keep moving west meant taking enormous risks, just personal risks, financial risks. Prudence was a meek word in tough, uproarious towns of the 1800s, an era when frontiersmen risked their lives simply by stepping outside their crude log cabins or huts. It's that kind of pioneer spirit um, where the government didn't impede in people's risk-taking or making money. Governments did, in, did regulate that much more in the European world than they, than they did here. But investing's history is a more recent one, um, and it's a more prudent one, um, uh, but uh, it's still one that fewer people, at least until the uh, post-1945, could become involved in because our society was much more stratified in terms of uh, you know, who had wealth and who didn't have wealth. Following World War II, retirement, a previously unknown concept, became a reality for which to plan. Advances in medicine and technology allowed people to live more comfortable, longer lives. People needed financial assistance. The focus fell on professionals marketing a solid recent past of predicting hot stocks or prophesizing the market ups and downs. Speculating and gambling had evolved into investment myths of high risk called past performance, market timing, and stock picking. Good morning, Dan. What's looking good today? If I knew, I wouldn't be in this business. The stock picking, the idea that you can continually buy and sell stocks that are going to beat the market. Um, this is a form of gambling because all the statistics and all the studies ever performed show that stocks are already trading at their true or efficient price, that markets work. Nothing known to man is predictable one-to-one -one correlation. We're always making judgments. If there's so much mispricing out there, how is it that all of these, all the smart money can't seem to find it? <laughs> My answer to that is simple. It's not there. <laughs> the prices are... Are, uh, are right. Past performance. Study after study has concluded that a manager's ability to pick the best stocks in one period and their ability to repeat in the future has zero correlation. None whatsoever. So wagering which manager is going to continue their hot streak is another form of gambling. And one of the questions we get a lot of is, uh, is this a good time to be in the market or I'm thinking about investing some money, should I do it now or should I wait? Um, we also get some questions about specific stocks, but I would say the market timing issue seems to be one of the most uh, often asked. Trying to forecast and predict which market is going to take off and which market is going to crash, thereby changing the asset allocation of your portfolio, again, is looking at a crystal ball, trying to foretell the future, and gambling on what's going to happen in the future. And I'm familiar with how difficult it is to predict one human being from day to day. If you throw into that mix predicting the hundreds or the thousands of human beings who are operating to produce the, the flow or, or the growth of an equity, and then you complicate that with the thousands of other human beings who are operating in competition, who, who are changing the economic forces that Im impact that equity. I'm, I'm only saying you compound all the more the uncertainty of being able to predict the future. I do tell them once in a while, well, here's what we're hearing from people that, you know, generally any time is a good time to get in the market. And if, if you're looking to invest and waiting for the right moment, you might be waiting 20 years and have missed out on a lot of gains. How many people? since 1982 have been saying that the market is too high year after year after year. I'm glad I stayed in. That was one of the benefits of being an efficient market person all this time. <laughs> I never got out. <laughs> the frustration comes in when they see poor performance. But I go back to the 1980s and small cap. It's reassuring to people at that point that know that it, it's the asset class and not the, the manager that's the source of this disappointment. Because then you can then go back to a, to a framework of, of risk and return and uh, not overreact and, and get whipsawed by getting out of asset classes when, uh, you know, when just after they're down. Chasing performance is probably one of the biggest problems that everyone faces as an investor because we're so psychologically set up to do that. The financial services industry understands people's behavior and they in fact contribute to reinforcing these these emotions because they have a way to profit from that studies show that approximately every three to five years a person having picked out a prudent diversification of uh, assets a uh, portfolio to last 
20 or 30 years to reach their goal, will start to lose patience and discipline, thereby chasing the whatever asset category was the highest or the manager was the highest. And, uh, and what they do is they end up taking more risk uh, than, they, than they really should. Because they, instead, of, instead of a prudent, diversified portfolio, uh, they end up with a, an asset category that could could lose a lot of money and, and take a long time to recover from. So it encourages a, a huge amount of risk taking uh, and a false sense of security in that this is a surefire way of investing. Chasing performance is common and very detrimental. It's um, certainly a case of hope springs eternal. Uh, it's much more exciting to talk about active managers and uh, who's holding the hot hands uh, today. That is sort of the sizzle of the press, you know. If, if there weren't those kinds of articles in magazines like uh, Money and Forbes and, and television shows like Wall Street Week wouldn't be able to exist. The advent of the internet and things like that, the media is really playing a, a very prominent role. Um, I, to me, the role should be to get as much information out there and make sure it's as accurate and as timely as possible. And uh, I think a lot of times the accurate part of it gets lost in the trying to be as timely as possible. And uh, I think you find that in all walks of uh, media and, and reporting, whether it's uh, investing or, you know, uh, politics or anything else, that people are, are getting to the point of wanting to rush something out there without checking out whether it's right or not. And that's how you get misinformation. And many forms of rapid fire, sometimes misinformation, exist in this era of tenacious 24-hour-a-day media deadlines and competition, including stocks being treated as a trivial nightly sports score. Certainly in the case of sports uh, in baseball, uh, a way above average athlete uh, is going to get way above average results. Uh, there's no sort of market mechanism that causes that person not to retain his or her comparative advantage. Uh, the same thing uh, might be true in uh, certain intellectual fields, but it's not true in the market. A person that's uh, more brilliant than everyone else will not be able reliably to earn higher returns than everyone else because the market process uh, squeezes out um, any pricing imperfections or at least tends to do that such that there are no high expected return securities just sitting on the table waiting for the smart person to come and take them. The Dow hitting 10,000 before, it's like somebody rushing for 2,000 yards, you know, or hitting 60 home runs. It's sort of tempting because you're dealing with so many numbers, and in sports you're doing the same thing, you know, with statistics and things like that. You're focused on the numbers, but there's also some important differences, and that's the thing people need to remember is, you know, you're, you're dealing with... Um, people's money that's over a long period of time and in sports you're dealing with more a season you know six months five months instead of thirty years rank speculation versus prudent investing i think is getting more confused today than ever if you will rank speculation with as easy as it is to get into the market today rank speculation wins and is, whole, is a whole lot easier ken was the operations manager of a bank for fifteen years as a banker gone bad so, and the banker gone bad part of me was bank fraud to, to pay gambling debts. After being fired, Ken served six months in a federal boot camp. His warning, simply being in the stock market does not automatically equal judicious investment. There are people that use the market to grow wealth. And there are some people that use the market, I think, to get rich quick and the get-rich-quick people are the gamblers in the market. What you don't do is try to get rich quick. In fact, um, somebody uh, had a quote the other day in one of our stories. They said it's uh, far easier to get rich slowly than it is to get rich quick. There are people that could be satisfied with owning 200 shares of a, of a company priced at $50 a share and watch the slow, methodical growth of that company. And then there are those people that need to have 5,000 shares of a company at two, wanting to see it go to four. And uh, the gamblers in the market, I think, are people that have thousands of shares of, of a lesser stock looking for that $2 stock to be four. Sort of that excitement, you know, w winning, but not just the money. It's also just the excitement of winning. The emotion you're talking about is the same emotion that, that you might find in somebody who's at the racetrack or betting in Las Vegas. That kind of emotion is, is the emotion that's stirred from the person investing in two, three, four, five, six dollar stock.
I think there's that illusion, and I think there's, it's often driven by that excitement about I can escape the the work-to-work -work day of having to go work and you know do it all day long to make my relatively minor amount of income. I think there's that illusion that we can hit it big, and I think that's a seductive quality that human beings have to struggle with. The person who finds it fun, if that's the right word to use, to bet on an NBA game or an NFL game or at the racetrack, there is something, there's a high that's achieved, or there's an adrenaline rush while that person is making that bet and while that game is going on. The same is true for me, at least, when I'm involved in the market. But I found myself chasing one lead after another. It never, it never seemed to grow the way you wanted it to grow. And often, uh, you know, often you're taking a half a point move the wrong way, and it's costing you money, plus the trades. You know, that money slowly evaporates. It's almost like a, a, a slow-draining death. The efficient market theory. What is it, and why is it important to investors? It's a very simple concept. It says that uh, prices basically reflect all available information. So that, in a strict view of the theory, it would say it's basically impossible to beat the, beat the market. You're always paying a fair price, basically. That's, that's the simple concept. Is the price is always, price is always fair. That, that's an important concept for investors because it says they're always paying fair prices. So their task is simplified. They basically have just have to decide what kind of uh, risk-return trade-off they want to be involved and how much risk they want to take in, in order to get more or less expected returns. But they don't have to worry about picking the stocks because they can operate under the presumption that the stocks will be fairly priced. How many people affect the markets of the world? All of them. Everyone that draws breath <laughs> in one way, shape, or form uh, affect the market. Nobody knows precisely what causes uh, markets to price securities and assets the way it does. Uh, their opinions are factored in, but so are, so are the opinions of six billion other people. And so the, the market is the only thing that possesses the implications of all of the information and insight and preferences and actions of all six billion people in the world. The market is a marvelously complex tool that takes information from all over the world and implements it into a pricing system. So you can think of the system of market pricers as a vast processing machine that takes all this information and brings it together. It's the only place where it's brought to bear. So you can have one individual who can be very, very smart and actually know a little bit more than everyone else. But does he know more than six billion people combined? No, he knows a tiny, tiny fraction of what is knowable and what's built into prices. And it's also what Adam Smith said about markets. Free markets set prices uh, based on supply and demand, and that's the basic underlying assumption of capitalism. Every individual in pursuing his own good is led as if by an invisible hand to achieve the best good for all. Therefore, any interference with free competition by government is injurious. Market forces of capitalism will produce the best results, economically and socially, if they are not tampered with. Adam Smith, 1776. 200 years after the invisible hand of Adam Smith founded the free market economy, the man anointed father of security selection renounced stock picking. Benjamin Graham wrote the stock picking anthem Security Analysis in 1934, but Graham converted to efficient market belief in 1976. I am no longer an advocate of elaborate techniques of security analysis in order to find superior value opportunities. This was a rewarding activity, say, 40 years ago when security analysis was first published. But the situation has changed. Today, I doubt whether such extensive efforts will generate sufficiently superior selections to justify their cost. I am on the side of the efficient market school of thought. When market prices change dramatically over a relatively short period of time, Many investment professionals say that such price movements are proof that markets are not efficient. We've had two big crashes in this century. One was an underreaction to subsequent economic events in 1929. You know, the, the economy turned out to be even worse than the 
initial crash would have predicted. The last one turned out to be a mistake. So one out of two is about exactly what you expect from an efficient market. It's the arrogance of people to think that if I can't explain an individual price change, the market has to be inefficient. That's why should you be able to uh, explain it? Who knows what went into that? What went into that price? We basically are in a universe that may have its own order, but it's not an order that we can predict and figure out and just sort of connect with and understand and, and predict. Think about other things that are spontaneously generated systems, and no one questions them. Everybody agrees that they work just fine. The best example is language. You know, outside of France, I don't think there's ever been a country or a government in the world that has proposed regulating language. It evolves perfectly fine. It works. There's over there's several hundred languages in the world, and we know that there are many languages that have died. They outlive their usefulness, so they don't need any regulation. Uh, culture evolves on its own without regulation, and markets are another one of those things, that they evolve, they incorporate information just fine as long as they are not interfered with. Nobody really understands the process by which you know, the markets work. You know, nobody understands the, uh, the nuts and bolts of it down to that particular microeconomic level, the individual person doing the, the buying and selling. But, and I don't expect to understand that during my lifetime. <laughs> so to understand prudent investing is to realize the internal functioning of markets are incomprehensible, while at the same time embracing as fact the spontaneous power of free markets objectively and efficiently order the prudent investing universe. I think the book on investing is a very short book. <laughs> I think it's probably only one or two pages. And it's probably not going to be for a thousand years from now, or at least a hundred. We're really going to see a mass movement away from speculation to true, prudent, long-term diversified investing. The single most important thing that we've learned from the academics is that diversification works. Uh, I like to quote Merton Miller on this. He, he says, diversification is your buddy. With diversification, you deploy your capital across you know, global boundaries because we know that the U.S. market, the European market, U.K., Japan, these all do, they, they don't move together. They move at different times and we don't know which are going to go up in any specific time in the future, so we own them all. And how does an individual become an investor who owns all of the asset classes throughout the world? We apply the scientific method, and we rely on the scientists themselves to be, tell us what that is. Men of distinguished academic valor like Drs. Harry Markowitz, William Sharp, and Merton Miller. The three men won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 1990 for their groundbreaking work on capital market pricing systems. Professors Fama and Kenneth French are possible Nobel candidates because of their brilliant study of risk and return dimensions. Professor French, what's the common sense relevance of your research for investors? Again, I think it's a great way to frame the portfolio allocation decision. I can look at it and say, am I comfortable with this exposure to the overall stock market? I can look at it and I say, Am I making the right trade-off between the expected return I get from buying small stocks and the risk that that brings? And then am I making the right trade-off between the expected return I get from buying distressed stocks and the risk that that brings? By answering those three questions, I frame that portfolio decision in a really easy way. Do you have any words of wisdom for would-be investors or advisors? Uh, yes, uh, diversify your investments. We shouldn't have all in one stock. We shouldn't even have all in uh, large or small stocks. And we shouldn't even all have all in one country. You know, we, we don't want it all just in the U.S. Don't trade very much. Own equities. Realize losses when you can. But don't realize gains. Buy when prices are relatively low and sell when prices are relatively high. Write your congressmen and senators and demand uh, an elimination of taxes on capital and dividends and interest. Uh, it's an onerous tax, particularly at a time when most of the people need to save for uh, retirement. Only in the last 10, 15, 20 years have we really understood where returns from stocks and investments come from. And it was largely done by research done by Eugene Fama, Kenneth French, Merton Miller. And really, the returns from stocks don't come because one person knows this stock is going to do better than that stock, but because the capital markets price securities for risk. So in that kind of market, it's, uh, 
impossible consistently to pick winners, just like it's impossible consistently to pick losers. So a market that works protects everybody, it protects the little guy just as much as it prevents the genius from getting above average returns. Remember I said uh, long term means lifelong. <laughs> These return premiums do not necessarily show up e even over 5, 10, or 15 years. So, you know, and they may never show up. That's the very definition of risk itself. If it was a guaranteed locked in thing, there wouldn't be risk. So there is risk, but long term investors re are rewarded because the capital structure of the markets reward it, not because someone can speculate and find out what the best stocks are. A three or five or 10 year period is, is, is too short a time to make very many statistical tests or inferences based on, on data. And that's the, the frustrating thing to people. So it's critically important that they understand their allocation and can live with it through thick and thin. The true destination of an investor should be peace of mind in the investment process and peace of mind in their, in their personal life around their money. If I can only get to I'll be happy or I'll be secure or I can stop worrying, and, and I don't look at it in investing as getting to a destination. Because successful investing is not a place that you get. It's a process, and that process is dynamic and changing. With a, a, a well-structured investment program, peace of mind will come the day they put that program in place. So, and here's what I'm talking about. If you save on a regular basis, if you're diversified, and if you have discipline, you know that when it comes time to educate your children, you know that when it comes time to retire, or you know that when you finally pass on that your heirs are going to have capital, you know from day one that if you do these things, you're not going to have to worry about any of those things that are coming in the future. And it normally requires a coach to help with the discipline of the process. Because sure enough, no matter how well the portfolio is put together and how uh, disciplined and well-meaning an investor is at the beginning. There will be times of extreme fear where the markets look bad, the newspaper looks bad, everything says uh, it's going to be terrible, you should get out of the market. And this is where the advisor is so important because the advisor brings discipline to the process. And without discipline, everything else we've learned goes out the window. You have to stay with it for the long term. I think the ultimate goal for the investor is to have a process and a relationship that will support them in their peace of mind. That has to be created not by the portfolio, but by knowledge, education, relationship, and discipline. I look at investing as a lifelong journey. There are two times in a man's life when he should not speculate, when he can't afford it, and when he can. Mark Twain.